Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. We talk about Gnosticism, Christian mysticism, and whatever I'm interested in this week. And welcome back to the show, Dr. Nathan Biorgi. It is a, a show a year and a half in the making. Uh, we are going to link uh, your other show in the show notes because uh, these are some dense topics. But at the same time, I, I think this might serve as an introduction for many people to the polemic uh, Gnostic Mass. Uh, I have trouble with my THs. I often pronounce them as Fs. You'll notice it throughout the show. Hey, look who else is back on the show. It's Nick Lachetti. Hey, Nick. How's it going? I I, I think uh, our fans, the the tens of them out there, you know, that's not true. We get about 3,000 hits. So uh, we love all 3,000 of you. You probably notice whenever we talk about anything close to Philema, we we often bring Nick on because uh, it's not anything I know about, but it is something I'm, I'm deeply interested in. We also bring Nick on for lots of other topics because he knows lots of things. Uh, <laughs> folks, I'm not a smart person. I just play one on the internet. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Biorgi, uh, we have a lot to, to talk about, so I guess we'll, we'll just dive into it. Again, everybody listen to, to our first interview with him. Um, can you give us like the Cliff's Notes or the elevator pitch explanation of what the Philemic Gnostic Mass is? Sure. Well, it's the central public ritual, if you could say worship or celebration. It's a ceremonial magical ritual. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is you get a congregation of people together and it's inspired by, although theologically also very distinct from um, the Roman Catholic, but also the Eastern Orthodox Eucharistic Mass um, during the Reformation. Uh, there's a lot of controversy over the status of the Eucharist, and it becomes a custom, particularly for the more radical wing of the uh, Protestant Enlightenment, to uh, eliminate to what's called stripping the altars, where you eliminate um, the uh, public ritual, ceremonial uh, types of worship. And so the, the, the practice of the Eucharistic Mass, although it is practiced by some Protestants, usually more the high church variety, tends to drop out of the more uh, evangelical types of uh, Christianity that subsequently become more mainstream, particularly and are, are particularly the basis for uh, American uh, society. Uh, whether you're actually Protestant or not, we all, if we're in the United States, and um, sorry to those outside of the United States who are listening to this broadcast, but um, I'm going to focus my remarks particularly on the American context because that's where I'm operative. Um, and so there's a lot of Protestant assumptions that underlie the culture. And um, when Aleister Crowley came along and was developing his philosophy, mystical, magical tradition of Thelema as a Gnostic tradition, we'll have more to say about what that means in the Thelemic context uh, versus a Christian context shortly. Um, he was, um, in 1913, he visited Russia uh, as part of a tour with uh, one of his girlfriend's uh, uh, musical bands, actually. She, she was uh, taking this group on a, a tour. It was called the Ragged Ragtime Girls. Hmm. Um, it was kind of a vaudeville type of performance. But anyway, Crowley accompanied them when they did a, a tour of uh, then Tsarist Russia. It was kind of the last... Although nobody knew it at the time, it was kind of the last chance to see the old Tsarist Russia because then um, about a year later, the First World War broke out. And then, uh, of course, there was the Russian Revolution and the whole culture uh, and political situation uh, completely changes in Russia after that. Uh, but Crowley encountered the uh, Eastern Orthodox spirituality and coming from a um, non-conforming Protestant evangelical background that he rejected in his younger days. Um, ceremonial magic was his way to, to uh, re-ritualize um, his relationship to spirituality and to Gnosis. Um, it's like if, if you're a, uh, from an evangelical background getting into uh, types of religiosity and particular religious practice that are considered verboten from an evangelical perspective, whether that's Jewish or high church, Christian, um, these are considered to be heretical or bad things from a from an evangelical point of view. Because remember, you're stripping the altars. You're just 
focusing on the purity of faith in Jesus Christ as the source of salvation. And so it's faith, not works, which are supposed to save you. But if you're a Gnostic, um, the knowledge that you have that is salvific can also be reinforced by symbolic ritual. Right, and that can right. be an important and powerful point in that. And you can practice magic and all kinds of stuff is going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so. I was just going to say, I, I can relate to that just a, a tiny bit with, uh, which we're also going to talk about the difference between the Flemic Gnostic Mass and perhaps the Gnostic Mass is celebrated uh, by my tradition. But uh, I, I come from from a low church, uh, United Church, uh, very liberal. But, you know, my grandparents were were Scotch Presbyterian, right? Sure, so a, can't a, a be more Calvinist glass, than that, right? Yes, right. A stained glass window was was popery, right? A, that's uh, right, that's wrong, that's <laughs> evil right there. They're you're yeah. worshiping statues and it's idolatry. Yeah, so I, I actually feel that with, with the... Um, the uh, I, I don't want to say that it's, it's perhaps liber as liberatory uh, as perhaps uh, it was for Crowley, right? But just for me, just a little bit to, to celebrate in a high church context, I kind of I kind of get that. I kind of uh, understand it. It does sort of work on a symbolic level for me, just because of my background. And even being in a more liberal tradition, which which I really loved and still love, I, you know, I, I love the the social gospel and I, I love the liberal Protestant tradition. But at the same time, I, I don't know if I'm if I, if I quite have that uh, breaking the rules feeling, but, but there is really something happening in, in, in the Mass or the Eucharist for me. And, and I think that is connected to my background. So yeah, I, I do really kind of understand where he'll be, uh, uh, where he's coming from. So uh, um, why, why did Crowley write it? You know, so you're telling us a bit about the influences, sure. but well, why did he, he actually compose it? Just a year or two before that, he'd gotten involved in this group called the OTO. Now, um, Crowley's own basic magical system is set forth in this teaching system called the AA, the uh, Order of the Silver Star, which is a kind of private pedagogy, usually with a teacher-student relationship, or you can read the stuff and practice it yourself, so you don't necessarily need to have any particular connection to anyone in particular, because it's all written out. But um, that is a um, based mostly on personal practice, and so it was becoming clear as that was kind of gaining momentum, uh, Crowley needed to promote Philema as a philosophy and as a religion, uh, exoterically, as it were, as well as esoterically, as a sort of social event. Uh, he needed a more ex exoteric or at least public um, contextual type of event to, 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 to get people together. Uh, and so um, at least initially, the um, he was excited about the possibility of this uh, German Masonic kind of amalgamation of stuff called the OTO that this guy Theodor Royce in Germany was promoting. Uh, and also because it involved um, an interpretation of the mysteries of Freemasonry in terms of a kind of sexual theurgy or magic where uh, sexuality was seen as a kind of uh, locus of the sacred. Uh, and again, this allowed him to push back against the uh, more ascetic, otherworldly, um, body denying aspect of the Christian colonial tradition. And uh, Crowley is kind of aligned with Friedrich Nietzsche in this way, in terms of exalting the spirituality of the body. Uh, William Blake talks about the, um, the sacred as being uh, an energy that is an energy that is of the body. Um, and so um, he's tapping into these deeper currents of thought that also relate to the radical enlightenment as well. Um, and a kind of turn towards um, sacred ritual or ceremonialism is also something that's part of Romanticism more generally. Uh, it was something of a thing in both um, German and to a lesser extent British uh, Romanticism for people to um, have what was called sometimes derogatorily medievalism, but they would often convert to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, as a, uh, sometimes this was a little bit more pro forma. It didn't necessarily mean a whole lot for someone like G.K. Chesterton to, you know, announce that they were now Catholic, except that it allowed them to connect to this medieval ritual ceremonial type of relationship to, to, to ritual and symbol that had been lost in the, in the, in the Protestant mainstream tradition. Yeah. And so it was a way for intellectuals or, or creative people to tap back into that. And so then neo-paganism comes along in the, with the, the advent of the Theosophical Society, which is the first major non-Christian kind of esoteric spiritual organization or movement. Uh, and so um, Crowley's attempting to um, both 
be part of, but also rethink the what you could call the Rosicrucian type of spirituality, uh, a type of resacralization or ceremonial magic that is part of the Protestant um, esoteric tradition, but now reinterpret it or move it in a more explicitly neo-pagan, um, post-Christian rather than um, um, direction, you could say. Yeah. Um, and so that relates to a variety of sort of philosophical priorities that we have that we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to get into as we talk more about the ritual itself. Um, and so again, while he was in Russia, um, he was impressed with the intense ceremonialism of the uh, really intensely kind of magical tradition that the, the Greek Byzantine tradition is more explicitly theurgic, even than the Roman rite. Yes. And part of the goal of it is what's called theosis, where you're attempting to become a kind of divine being yourself through a kind of, uh, I mean, it is, a, it is really a kind of Gnosticism, uh, even though, of course, there's various theological excuses as to how it can be uh, conformed to um, what's seen as a more orthodox view of um, Christian salvation. Um, the Protestants weren't buying any of that, but that's okay because what the things are now maneuvering to, to, to bring these threads back into being woven together again. So anyway, Crowley got the idea for the Gnostic mass then. And so he thought, okay, well, what if I write like um, a Eucharistic ritual, but it's going to be a Gnostic pagan Thelemic magical ritual, but it'll be inspired by the, the, the Eucharist of the Catholic or Orthodox mass. Um, but returning to a kind of Gnostic type of, you could call it Christianity or a kind of pan Sophic Sophia, uh, a kind of pan wisdom type of tradition. Uh, I mean, we have to keep in mind that when Crowley's talking about Gnosticism in a, um, he's referring to a kind of late classical context where Gnosticism is this intensely synthetic category and it's not so confessionally confined in a way that after the Nicene um, creedal intervention, uh, the later Roman official Christian religion uh, kind of clamps down on all these different diverse variations and um, stuff that's called nominally Christianity earlier um, is much more open to this um, wider conversation with uh, pagan, hermetic, Jewish, other kinds of um, Zoroastrian, uh, other types of, uh, you know, spiritualities, Manichaeism, and all this stuff is in a kind of really complex, convoluted conversation where a lot of the boundaries aren't very clear. And so Crowley is kind of hearkening back to that more syncretic, synthetic context to weave together these various threads. Yeah. Um, Can I ask, a, I guess a, this yes. on our list, but I feel like it might come up, especially with some viewers who are not familiar with Thelema. So I know we we're at, talking about kind of what, how it's similar to other Gnostic masses or Catholic mass or Orthodox mass. But I think another um, misconception people have is that it's a black mass or like a the mass of the satanic church or something like that. So I just wondered what, you don't have to talk too much about it, but just no, sure. Yeah. Um, actually, I think the relationship, at least uh, aesthetically, of the Gnostic mm -hmm. Mass yeah. to you could say the Black Mass as a kind of literary concept mm -hmm. uh, is actually an important part of the Mass because it, it involves an antinomian element. Mm -hmm. And Crowley is trying to push back against uh, Christian colonial bourgeois social norms, particularly heterosexual norms. Mm -hmm. um, the Gnostic Mass is. Uh, in fact, already a queer ritual. You just mm -hmm. have to know how to how to look at it. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll have yeah. more to say about that in a moment because there's been an, uh, significant attempts more recently to, I think, misinterpret the Gnostic Mass as if it implies a kind of heterosexual mm -hmm. um, interpretation of sexual magic. There's queer stuff all over the Mass if you just open your eyes mm -hmm. to sort of look at what's going on. It occurs under the presidency of Baphomet, who's this mm -hmm. kind of transgender figure maybe intersex, it involves a, um, the, the um, there's a lot of liminality to the gender language that's used in the mass. And to interpret that in a gender essentializing way, either biologically or otherwise, I think is a misreading of the Gnostic mass and of Crowley's intention. But there's an irony to that because the people who want to interpret it that way often say, oh, we want to uphold, we want to do this the way that Crowley intended. Mm -hmm. But then they have this sort of yeah. heterosexual interpretation of that, and that's not what Crowley intended. Mm -hmm. um, Crowley's a deeply queer mystic, 
and um, you you can't take the queerness out of Crowley. You don't you don't have Philema anymore. Yeah, yeah. If you do that, um, and of course that's not um, exclusive of people you know such as myself who are also heterosexual. But it's just that it needs to occur in that um, in that more diverse space of of of, of potential self expression, mm -hmm. um, which of course can also include um, you know gender non conforming heterosexuals, for example. You know, there's all, all kinds of ways to sort of be mostly straight, but, you know, kind of um, queer up the edges of that a little bit, too. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to be, you know, just this kind of. Um, the, and so Crowley's pushing back against that. And so the, the mystique of the black mass is in a way part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it serves to subvert or signal the subversion of um, uh, patriarchal heteronormative bourgeois, you know, uh, patriarchal se uh, sexual norms and so forth that he's trying to kind of explode with this, this ritual and his philosophy of Thelema. And so, um, which of course the, the basis of that is the, the criteria, the theological criteria of the law of Thelema, which is do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. And love is the law, love under will. Not meaning um, the Christian criteria, which is Faith and obedience to Jesus Christ is the Messiah that you're obedient to and then obey all these sort of, um, especially in a Protestant context, these puritanical sort of social norms that are assumed to uh, signify your election if you're sort of a good boy behaving properly in these ways. And, um, um, and so, but of course, then you can't actually know that you're saved because it's just this big mess. I, we don't need to go out into that, the, the problems with Calvinism. Um, but... Um, this is very much the mode of being a modern subject emerges in Puritan Protestant culture. This is, you know, harks back to Mac, Max Weber's famous thesis about the, the Protestant ethic. But what he's basically articulating there is, is that what we now take to be modern bourgeois subjectivity, what we call individuality, um, uh, emerges first in a, basically through um, a, a certain type of Puritan uh, confessionalism and um, and then spreads out from there with the spread of capitalism through globalized capitalism and this culture that spreads through that. And so Thelema is both part of that because it does advocate a type of individuality, but it wants to re-socialize that individuality. So it's not just alienated and, and separated from everybody else. And so how do you do that? Well, the Gnostic mass is a way to for everybody to come together and sort of celebrate their unique, the uniqueness, but also the community at the same time of their self-expression of divinity. Um, and so again, it offers this social platform for doing that as a, as a kind of group magical ritual. And for that reason, I think has a very central uh, importance um, to the particular kind of magic that, that Crowley was promoting. And of course, this is useful potentially uh, as a model or, you know, something to experience for people of all kinds of different, um, you know, Gnostic or magical traditions, whether, you know, whether those are Wiccans or, or other types of Gnostics or, or whatever, or even people who are Christian, but not in a um, more mainstream exoteric mm -hmm. sense or understanding of that, that there's still also this Rosicrucian element in Thelema mm -hmm. that's also compatible with that as well, although, of course, it's been Gnostically inter reinterpreted, mm -hmm. of course, so it's not... Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Or keep going. Yeah. Ask me some more to, to no. listen. Oh yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I think that did. I think it, it's interesting to hear about um, how it's kind of how the kind of the allure of the black mass has like a, a role in it, and that you can definitely see that in kind of the literary nature of it as well if you just read it. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's also a a, a, mag a sincere magical element of yeah. you could say Satanism with, or maybe Luciferianism would be a better yeah, yeah. way to describe mm -hmm. it within Thelema, where the archetype or um, symbolic uh, god form of mm -hmm. Satan or Lucifer uh, represents the bestower of, of um, gnosis. So of course there's the, mm -hmm. I think it's originally Sethian, but there's this interpretation of Genesis where um, the serpent, rather than being the tempter, is actually the deliverer of gnosis because it, right. yeah. um, he informs human beings that they contain the spark of the Pleroma within themselves because when they eat the apple, they're able to then know that they're gods and that that's, that's actually the real 
message of mm -hmm. spirituality and then the evil god that creates the universe the aldaba oath who's masquerading as yahweh the transcendent deity appears and then tries to punish humanity for having this this knowledge um and you could say this is the kind of promethean um satanic element that's in thelema and um and part of that philosophy and so crowley often adopts a kind of uh, satanic style or motifs so he portrays himself as the great beast of revelation mm -hmm. uh the number 666 that's his sort of personal magical persona for example um and what that means is that he's he's overthrowing the christian colonial world order which at the time as a victorian is represented by the the british empire and that that he he recognizes as many people critical of, of colonialism at the time that this is going to have to come to an end that this is going to have to break up so that something else more complex and diverse can emerge or reemerge from it um, because it's become too sta culturally stale and stuck and de it's degenerating. Hmm. Um, and this is, of course, the, the crisis for a lot of um, white Europeans in the towards the end of the colonial period in the late 19th, early 20th century. They're all obsessed with degeneracy or how things are. Um, you see it in H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's fiction, for example, where um, it's all these um, old New England wasp families who are like degenerating and turning into fish people or something like that because their <laughs> um, their 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 culture has become decadent because um, colonialism is is it, it it can't it's empty it's 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 falling apart it can't be it it, it the writing's on the wall. You know the, the moving fingers written on the wall that uh, this must um, this must come to an end, and so the um, the revelation of the Book of Law and Philemon is in the way, at least seen by Crowley, is a kind of prophecy of this um, apocalyptic breakup of the um, European colonial Christian order, and then there's going to be the uh, reemergence of Gnosis from that in a complex, diverse way, which might or might not call itself Philemon. It could be whatever, but it's you know, Crowley intends the Lima to be sort of like a paradigm marker for what that could be and try to work out some of the parameters of that. Then people can engage with that however they want, because, of course, the principle is do what thou will. And so then the Gnostic mass is like the encapsulation of all of the philosophy and sort of context of that in a public ritual, which then also signifies a kind of sexual theurgy, kind of do it yourself enlightenment and um the idea is that the participants of the ritual are supposed to figure that out and then they could, you know, potentially apply that in their own, in their own personal, personal ways. Um, and this is the, the ritual has an interesting history. It's, um, uh, it was practiced a little bit at the Abbey of Thelema in uh, Sicily. Um, and then Terry Royce did some, probably some performances of the Gnostic Mass at this uh, pan masonic conference that he did in Ascana in switzerland at one point uh that was either um i think during or, or um the the first world war uh switzerland was neutral territory at that point so you could still kind of like for example um rudolf steiner's anthroposophy when the war breaks out they retreat to switzerland to keep active because you know, uh, Germany's having some problems going on <laughs> at this yeah. time. And so if you want to get anything happen, everything's getting disrupted if you're there. So there's a lot of German um, theosophists and magicians who kind of retreat to Switzerland. Uh, and they have like these um, resorts that they're hiding out on. Uh, there's a Thomas Mann novel called The Magic Mountain that's about this, uh, about all these like decadent intellectuals who are hanging out at a sanitarium and you know, trying to figure out why civilization is collapsing. But anyway, so um, it's Nick and I's right. goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. goals right there. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the Gnostic Mass is like part of that part of that conversation. Oh, that's really cool. uh, and so then Taylor Royce dies in the early twenties. Crowley takes over the OTO, uh, but then he had a lodge in England, but then it got raided during the war and shut down, and he's never quite able to get it going in England again and so then the big working oto group is in california in um los angeles eventually pasadena um run first by wilford smith and then this fellow called uh, jack parsons 
and of course the really good book by George Pendle, Strange Angel, which is about that. And the big thing that they practiced at Agape Lodge, um, technically Agape Lodge number two, because there was an earlier version of it in Vancouver, but it then moves Proper down Akai. to California. Yeah. Yes, under Akai. Yeah. And then Wilfred Smith and then Parsons take over in uh, Southern California. And it gets to be one of the big party houses in Hollywood <laughs> at that time. And it's kind of a big deal. And um, Robert Heinlein's hanging out there. And um, uh, a, a number of um, uh, a number of kind of interesting um, interesting people. John Carradine probably visited the house. There's there's lots of people who are kind of in and out of the. Yeah, Ray Bradbury. Uh, in, Ray, Ray Bradbury probably we don't know for sure. But he probably was there. there anybody who was involved in the L.A. science fiction fan scene mm -hmm. um, had a heavy overlap with stuff that was going on at this at this house, uh, and uh, that's where Grady McMurtry got introduced through because Jack Parsons was friends with uh, Robert Heinlein and would often be hanging out at Los Angeles uh, fan science fiction fan club events. And there were kind of two main, you know, basis for fandom in science fiction at the time. There was the Futurians uh, in New York with Isaac Asimov and um, a number of other people there as kind of the scene so it was Isaac Asimov and company in New York. But then if you were in L.A., it was Heinlein and Ray Bradbury. He was very young at that time. Bradbury was kind of more the senior figure. He was a little bit older in his 30s, I think. He was considered like the senior. Because <laughs> most of the people involved are like teenagers or, or in their 20s. Um, and so uh, they thought John W. Campbell, who was the main editor of, of Astounding, was like this senior, older, like, person he's like 25 or something at the time it's a it's it's funny to to kind of look back on that but anyway um so you've got uh, a lot of people hanging out at the house and it turns out that uh and this is something that uh george pendle does some good work researching um there's a kind of suppressed history to uh agape lodge where it was also a significant hangout for a lot of refugees from hungary and germany who were communists mm -hmm. and uh it was also a significant queer pickup house mm -hmm. uh and so um you know at, at different times and different places there's different contexts for uh gay or queer people to socially meet whether that's certain bars or bathhouses, certain bathhouses in San Francisco or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Kenneth Anger, who's uh, a young man living in Los Angeles, is taking buses up to San Francisco to go to the bathhouses there. But he's also hanging out at um, at Agape Lodge because, uh, and I, I note this because there's been a tendency more recently, again, to um, try to kind of, it's, it's this unconscious heteronormative tendency to kind of de-queer or cover up the, this earlier um uh so for example by focusing on parsons who was bisexual but mostly interested in women as the main leadership figure there it obscures that uh wilford smith uh was you know um to be blunt sleeping with a lot of men at the house and using it for this purpose but so was a cod because a cod's also queer and so that the, in fact, the lodge at Vancouver is probably more queer than straight. And then it's moving down to, by intention. And then it's moved because Crowley always um, has the, the moment he's involved in the OTO, he's querying it, querying it up. And so the OTO under, under Crowley is never specifically hetero specific. And, and yet more recently, um, particularly in the kind of, um, you know, bourgeois, straight, middle-class, neo-pagan reception of Philema Moore in the 70s and 80s and moving forward, um, there's been a tendency to de-emphasize and kind of cover up that history. So you have a kind of vocal minority currently, you could call them kind of the libertarian wing, the, the right wing or conservative wing of, of either Philema or neo-paganism generally, um, which has kind of been on steroids in the Trump era a little bit. And they're the they're not the majority, they're the minority. But because th there's a lot of very vocal trolls on the internet, there they maybe get a little more attention than they do. And so, um, 
they've tried to appropriate Jack Parsons as kind of this uh, libertarian in their sense, because he wrote this essay called Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword, where he calls himself a liberal. But what he means by that is that he's a New Deal socialist, mm -hmm. because that's what liberals who are members of the Democratic Party at that time, right, are in an American context. Um, and in fact, part of the so-called Suicide Squad, which was the rocketeers at Caltech, who Parsons is hanging out with, they're all communists. And um, Parsons often hung out at Communist Party meetings. He never officially joined the party. Remember, this is before the uh, Hitler-Stalin pact, and so uh, which kind of made communism start to be unpopular because things, it was becoming more clear that things were getting really weird in the Soviet Union, and maybe it wasn't as it wasn't this wonderful utopia over there where everybody everything's cool. And no, maybe it's not that. And uh, and so the conversation becomes more complicated around. Um, what being part of the left means in a, an American context, mm -hmm. but especially in the, in the 30s, there's, uh, and especially earlier in the 30s, there's still this kind of flag waving, you know, uh, fellow traveler with, you know, what's imagined to be going on in the Soviet Union kind of, um, kind of popular communism. And um, a lot of the um, Eastern European and also German revolutionary movements that were going on after the initial Bolshevik revolution, a lot of those people go into exile into the United States. Um, and a lot of those people get involved in alternative spirituality. And a lot of those people wind up being Thelemites. And in fact, Crowley has always had a significant following both in Germany and also in uh, the Balkans, particularly. And also in, um, uh, he uh, has always been actually quite popular in areas associated with the former Yugoslavia, for example. Uh, and many of those people were and continue to be um, on the left of the political spectrum, either for cultural or, uh, or other, other reasons. Um, and so a lot of those people wind up in the United States and then they wind up hanging out at Agape, uh, at Agape Lodge. And so um, I'll even go so far as to read this uh, little bit. Um, Sorry, just a moment. It's at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, it says um, Parsons is showing up at the Agape Lodge for the first time. Quote, an air of excitement hung over the small group like that of a theater audience, anxiously headed towards their seats before a curtain. The group's members seem to be a mixture of actors, German and Russian immigrants, and young Bohemians. A lot of these people are also from Hungary, where there was a communist revolution that got crushed after the first world war um and uh, and so again i just i'm mentioning this to to kind of um diversify the the conversation around um who this ritual is for who gets to appropriate it for their own kind of um interpretive interpretive purposes um and um my point in referring to this is just to indicate that this has always been a more diverse conversation than maybe certain um, conversation partners would would want to imply. Um, conservatives always want to present uh, themselves as the sole interpreters of what things are supposed to mean or be about. And the picture is always, always broader than that. And so um, anyway, uh, mm -hmm. any further questions for the, the, our list or things we want to talk about the mass or look at the ritual itself or yeah. what do we want to do? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say, uh, that, you know, every time, uh, and a, another quirk of mine that uh, our dedicated fans will notice is when we have conversations like this, I suddenly remember or am motivated to do a thousand more shows. So I really have to do a show on Jack Parsons. Uh, everybody, there, there is a sci-fi writer, a certain redhead that he uh, that he met at Agape named L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, anyways, it was a happy ending. Everything worked out fine. Uh, but I really need to do a show on that. I really need to do a show on Marjorie Cameron. I really need to do a show on Kenneth Anger, who is still alive. Yes, uh, still going. <laughs> still going. Yeah. So, um, but uh, that, that's all for the future. Maybe maybe even just a separate show in Agape Lodge. But uh, I would say, and I do have to clarify, um, 
with my own particular tradition, some people have accused it of being satanic or Luciferian. It isn't. There's no satanic elements in, in our in our mass. I mean, I, I guess you could interpret it, you know, loose for the light bringer, but that, it's not in there, folks. Uh, if you if you have any uh, questions about that or you're angry, uh, email Jason at Gnostic <laughs> But uh, th this is a good a good time to perhaps talk about that. Like the Gnostic masses of, say, my church that yes. I'm in are, are pretty similar to, to what you would see at a Catholic or an Episcopalian church. Uh, more Gnostic language, but very recognizable. Uh, as one of our bishops said, you know, we're the Gnostic church that you can bring your Nona to. You, you can bring your grandmother to. So is, is the Gnostic mass of, of, of Philema, the of Philema Gnostic mass, similar to that? A little bit, but it also has a number of differences. So uh, there's both a priest and a priestess. Um, there's an altar that has a veil that goes across it on one side of the room. And then on the other side, there's a, uh, like a tomb, like a standing up tomb that the priest starts the ritual in as if they're symbolically dead. And then they're covered with a veil there as well. And so the, and then there's a, uh, another set of altars that are kind of in the middle of the room along the central axis. And everybody kind of sits around the, the rim. And so, uh, at the beginning of the ritual, the priestess, um, enters and they um, magically revive the priest from the tomb. Uh, and this is to uh, symbolize the, the uh, erection of the magical phallus, uh, which is what's referred to as the Lord or the sun in the ritual, the Lord of life and light. Um, now, uh, phallus um, is uh, an important kind of mystical concept because um it does not necessarily specifically refer to the uh, male genitalia. It has a broader signification of just the divine libidinal energy, uh, which could also be expressed through uh, what's called the lady in the mass, uh, which is the, also the, the, the yoni or the um, uh, symbolically feminine uh, category of, of, of um, symbolism related to that. Now, What's important is to not introduce a kind of biological essentialism into the interpretation of these symbols, which are actually fluid, because uh, remember, also, there's the figure of Baphomet in the Gnostic mass, who's this androgynous or uh, transsexual figure as well. So um, I think it's important to interpret uh, gender language in terms of presenting roles rather than essences. So, for example, there's a priest and priestess. But those could be played by, those roles could be played by um, people of any uh, physical or biological gender or interpretation of gender. Um, and this is the, the way to practice the Mass that is preferred by the tradition that I'm part of, which is the independent Gnostic Mass tradition. Um, there have been political tendencies more recently in the Thelema community to introduce a kind of gender essentialism. Uh, I think that's open to a significant amount of criticism um, and also aligns with the tendency to de-queer the, the Gnostic mass. So for example, phallus um, for Crowley always has a queer signification. Hmm. And so is not, it's already not the patriarchal or heteronormative aligned symbol of male uh, authority. Um, that's already been kind of um, esoterically undermined at the moment of putting forth the symbol. So, you know, the question could then be asked, why use it at all? And I think it, it has an important role in the sense that it, it marks the um, pre-existence of patriarchy so that that ideology can then be analyzed and dismantled and reconfigured during the ritual. Right. Um, so, for example, um, once the priest is brought back to life, um, there's some speeches. He takes the priestess by hand and leads her up to the, the top of the, the temple, seats her upon the altar, and then closes the veil. Um, so then the priestess is being veiled, uh, which could be interpreted as a patriarchal symbol, but she's being veiled for the purpose of unveiling her. So again, it's kind of, you're, you're starting with what appears on the surface to be traditional gender language or roles, but then those are made more complex and open to additional valences of interpretation through the process of this uh, implicitly queer ritual, uh, which then um, 
opens up this opens up this space for the reinterpretation and reappropriation of uh, what is originally, you know, traditional gender language, but they can take on all these additional significations that's really quite open-ended. So then the priestess is then um, seated on the, um, on the high altar, the veil is drawn, the priest circumambulates three times, uh, and that relates to the symbolism that comes from the uh, rituals of Freemasonry. And then there's a series of um, speeches where the priest stands before the veil and invokes the, invokes the infant in the form of the goddess. Um, and in the Thelemic theogony, this is the goddess Nuit, of, which is the um, Egyptian um, sky goddess that her body is shown as arched over the heavens. And so she's the night sky, but then that's also um, the infinite space-time continuum that then the uh, quanta point event of the uh, individuality, which is um, seen as the winged solar disk of uh, what's called Hadith in, or the, the Behadite, Horus the Behadite or Hadith in the, um, uh, in the Book of the Law, which then represents the point of individuality, which is then coming into communication with the infinite. And then those mediate with each other and that uh, allows for the sacred as represented by the solar deity Horus to then uh, emerge. And that's represented by the sacraments, which then after the goddess is invoked, the veil is opened. And then the priestess is then worshiped by the priest as the, as the goddess is the um, symbol of the divine. So there's also goddess worship then in the, um, uh, in the ritual, which is, um, highly influential in uh, Wicca. And in fact, the third degree of traditional Gardnerian witchcraft is basically a, um, I mean, it's more than than just a, a Wiccan version of the Gnostic mass, but there's a significant amount of symbolism in specifically the third degree of traditional Gardnerian witchcraft that derives from the Gnostic mass. So yeah. there's, there's um, a fair amount of Crowley in, in Gardner in general, which I, I only started noticing the last couple of years when I went back to read Gardner. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, language theology in a way um gardner is getting the whole idea of what magic is from uh crowley's interpretation of that and so uh, crowley's theory of magic is basically um underlies almost all current forms of um uh at least popular neo-paganism um you know there's other figures and other stuff going on but he, he's really this important um fundamental figure that um even if there's differences there they're, they're He's always the elephant in the room. There's always this kind of conversation where you're triangulating around um, the, the the concepts and categories that were kind of put in place by by uh, Crowley's interpretation in in a, in a modern context of of what magic is supposed to be. Um, so Gardner is very much using that as his starting point to then further elaborate a type of goddess-centered worship. Uh, Jack Parsons was doing this in the early '50s. Uh, it was trying to articulate something he called the witchcraft. And so it's kind of, you could see him moving towards a kind of American version of, of what Gardner was doing in, in, uh, in England at the kind of at the same time. And um, you could see if Parsons hadn't, um, you know, killed himself in this laboratory explosion that <laughs> very dramatically that he might've played a role in kind of the, the spread and development of, a, of, of uh, witchcraft in the, in an American context uh, as well. Um, Anyway, so um, the Gnostic Mass then also has this intense goddess worship part of it as well. And so then um, what the priest and priestess do is they then cooperate together to consecrate a uh, host, a Eucharistic wafer, which is called uh, a cake of light, which is terminology that derives from the, the Book of the Law. There's a description of this thing called the cakes of light in that. There's a recipe given there for its construction. And then also a, a, a chalice of wine, which represents the, the Holy Grail. Now, something interesting happens with the um, consecration of these elements. I just want to point this out because it underscores the um, fluidity of gender roles in the Gnostic Mass, which you can miss if you're just having a kind of exoteric heteronormative take on the ritual. But if you're looking more closely, you can see these uh, kind of gender fluid or queer elements in the Mass. Um, so, um, you've got the cake of light and the chalice of wine. Okay. Well, these obviously represent, uh, two gender roles, 
But then the question is, which and which and who is who? What what do, what does which corresponds to which? So um, earlier in the ritual, the priest refers to the cake of light as the um, what he calls the fruit of labor, sustenance of endeavor, and the nourishment of the spirit. And then meanwhile, the wine stands for the um, libidinal energy that then animates that physical body. So wine is then the solace of labor, inspiration of endeavor, and ecstasy of the spirit. So uh, in that sense, the, the cake represents um, um, the cake represents form, and the wine is um, is force. So you've got um, matter and energy. Um, so then in, in that context, the, 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 the cake is traditionally feminine. And then the, um, the wine would then be masculine or the inseminating force of that. Okay, so, uh, but then later in the ritual, um, these get reversed. So um, in the consummation of the elements that occurs after the anthem, the priest breaks off a particle of the host and refers to it as spermomoi, which is Greek literally for my sperm. And then the priestess elevates the chalice and then the priest puts the particle on the edge of their lance and dips it into the, the chalice. So then in that context, the cake of light then represents the sp spermatic quote unquote male element. And then the chalice is then the, the, the feminine element. So you see it's been inverted. It's been reversed again. So it's a kind of both end. It depends on which each of the symbols can be male or female, depending on what how it's being used in the, in the ritual. So in other words, um, there's a kind of sublation of traditional gender dimorphism. The signifiers, male and female, slide about. They exchange places with each other during the ritual. And so there's a kind of alchemical countercharging which signifies a, a kind of mediation of essences where their opposition has been overcome. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that this is going on in the mass because there's of course always this tendency to reassert patriarchal or traditional uh, gender dimorphic um, interpretive modes. And um, the Gnostic mass I think is intentionally designed to subvert those it uses traditional gender language in order to subvert that, the traditional interpretations that you have of that language. And it's very easy for people to come along and miss that in the mass because it's kind of, it's this esoteric subtext. Crowley doesn't spell out, oh, look, I switched the attributions. He just does it in the ritual. And you're, you're supposed to come along and notice that he does that. And if you don't, you can miss that. Right. So I, I'm, I'm just pointing that out. And then what happens then is after these have been consecrated, the host and the waif and the, and the wine, then the congregation comes and they eat the wafer and they drink the wine. And then everybody does that in turn. And then they turn to the congregation and they cross their arms over their chest and they say, there is no part of me that is not of the gods. And so it's an affirmation then of self-divinity, which is the basic Gnostic message of the of the mass that we all contain the, we're all expressions of the divine. We all have that uh, pleuromic spark. We are, we're all expressions of that Hadith divine essence, the um, uh, quanta event of our own, uh, our unique expression within the divine space time continuum. Uh, and so that's the, that's the Gnostic message of the mass that then you take these two elements and you mediate or combine them within your own body and then again, Hadid or Nuid or the male and the female or the female or the male or the male that's female or the, or the male that is also the female or vice versa or however you want to, however you want to play that out. Um, these two seeming opposites are then shown to be non-dual and combined. And then you have the expression of the unity that's also the not, the, the Kabbalistic zero, the ultimate openness, the free openness of reality, which you're then creatively making yourself in as a, as a divine event. You're then finding your, your projecting yourself forward according to your true will, which then is the expression again of the theological criteria, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, which is expressed as love under will, which is then 
um, symbolized by, in Greek, the words thelema or will or agape or love, both add to the number 93. And so this indicates that they're expressing the same, the same basic Gnostic truth. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the form of the ritual. And you could see how that's both similar to, but also different from um, the more traditional form of the Christian uh, mass, as it were, with the altar and the consecration of the elements upon the altar and the Eucharistic mystery that's celebrated there where the body and blood are seen as the body and blood of the Messiah, the divine being, the Christ, which then become his body and blood, uh, whether you understand this symbolically or literally, depending on which confession you're part of. And then by consuming that, the worshipers are then brought into intimate communion with the divine through the mediation of the, the body and blood, the literal, physical, or symbolic, physical presence of the, uh, the figure of the Messiah that then mediates that. And so in Thelema, in a sense, every magical practitioner has becomes the Messiah to themselves, but uh, posited through the, their, their kind of self-divinization, through a kind of self-transcendence that's represented through this magical uh, signifier called the Holy Guardian Angel or the Higher Divine Self that they're trying to get into communication with. And then the ritual of the Gnostic Mass is a way to do that. In addition to whatever private magic they're doing, this would be a kind of communal way to come together and worship together and then realize that realize that gnosis so i don't know if this answers your question but that's the that's the way in which it's similar to but also a little bit different from the the, the form the traditional form of the so it's again a kind of just like gender language is being um i like the term reappropriation here so it's like um it has this traditional context of meaning and then this ritual is taking that, but it's reinterpreting it at the same time that it's deploying or using these traditional forms. So just like gender language superficially appears to be the same as what's going on before, but it's not. And likewise, there's these uh, Catholic sacred ritual elements that are being brought into play. But again, they're also being reinterpreted in this Gnostic way where it's not so much um, pistis as a, as a, uh, allegiance to or obedience to the messiah as the criteria for salvation but realization of your own divinity as the criteria as the salvific uh element the, the 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 sacerdotal gnosis that's being actualized through ceremonial magic through this this ritual where you have these magical symbols that are brought into play and then that those are signifiers that that indicate that linguistically trigger your own understanding your own knowledge of what you're supposed to understand from the from the ritual about ultimately yourself and your own divinity mm -hmm. but then that's also expressed in community with other people who are also divine so you're coming together and you're trying to relate to each other and then the symbolism for that in Thelema is the idea of this company of heaven which is the body of Nuit, and you have all the stars in it and those stars are the individual divine persons that are then in the company of heaven this divine community of the universe um yeah. which which is a very gnostic idea if you ask me and it's also what many of the ancient gnostics were were getting at exactly uh, so yeah. it's a recovery it's also a recovery of that earlier understanding that's then kind of darkened over and um suppressed by christian colonial orthodoxy these um uh this this oppressive uh regime that comes in um, and creates this this world situation then and then we're, we're still now in the 21st century trying to liberate ourselves from that from that particular legacy of sexism racism and classism that was created out of that um the the first global fully globalized human civilization in which we're brought into this kind of now global human community but it starts out in this really hegemonic oppressive mode and so the we still we want to retain that global human community, but we also want to liberate ourselves within that space. So it's not expressed through this kind of organic hierarchical uh, imposition, but more this kind of anarchy of being where we can come into a more spontaneous and creative community with each other. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the message of the Lima in the Gnostic in the Gnostic Mass. Um, anyway, we, we have some more questions. I think we're. Yeah. Got maybe about 15 minutes or more to, to go. So there's a few more questions I might be able to address if we're going to go an hour and a half for the, sure. for the yeah. interview. Yeah, we, we can go longer too if you're free. Okay, sure. So, I'm, yeah, I'm available to go a little bit more. We can, yeah. 
Uh, uh, Nick, actually, so if we do have a little bit more time before we move on to to the question sheet, Nick, do, do you have anything uh, to, to add? Because, of course, I know you and I have talked a lot about the Mass, the Eucharist, mm -hmm. uh, and some of these topics, but it, uh, so I just thought I should check in. Um, I think I feel like a little bit there, maybe the question that I had at the end of the list might be a little okay. useful. I mean, it might be a really big question, but since no, we're go doing ahead. The, so the question I had, because one of the things I really love about your dissertation is the kind of the discussion of Crowley and nothingness in the zero equals two equation. Yes. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how the Gnostic mass kind of enacts or, you know, symbolizes that. I think some of that was coming out when you're just describing the movement of the mass, but for people less familiar with kind of Thelemic metaphysics and Nuit and Hadit, um, kind of is that, I think maybe Crowley's idea about zero equals two sometimes feels abstract to people as opposed to kind of connected to the heart of kind of his magical practice. So yeah, it sure. could be useful to talk more about that. Okay. Well, I think a good way to start would be to talk about the um, role or function of this signifier phallus mm -hmm. that appears in the, the ritual. And that links also to a kind of um, Lacanian mm -hmm. psychoanalytic an uh, analysis of, of um, language and psychology and symbolism that I think really richly can um, be used as an interpretive lens for the Gnostic mass. So under traditional patriarchy, which is undergirded by um, the legacy of what Martin Heidegger calls philosophy with a capital P or the tradition with a capital T, by which he means a certain type of metaphysics that derives ultimately from Platonism, mm -hmm. but also from the late Roman Neoplatonic tradition, which is the main undergirding philosophy of um, a certain type of at least initially emergent, uh, what you could call Western esotericism and early, early modernity. Um, and what I think Thelema is doing in conjunction with a number of other thinkers and figures um, is to both try to further certain philosophical insights that derive from that tradition, but also cr uh, provide an imminent critique of certain assumptions that are inherent to that tradition that are also tied to uh, negative versions of, of the, the um, again, this sort of exoteric Christian colonial oppressive tradition. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, this can all be kind of consolidated into a consideration of what Lacan calls the master signifier, uh, which is particularly represented by this function or term phallus, which designates um, the dominance of the male um, subject um, that's also understood as heterosexual and so forth that is then seen as, as dominant or controlling uh, as the one who can speak or have the, the voice that can command um, that has a kind of what um, Jacques Derrida calls being as presence that has a kind of unity to or totality to its being that is denied to um, people that are part of other social locations whether those are the uh, archetypally other sex of woman or other um, other gender or sexual uh, locations that aren't reducible to the man-woman gender dimorphism, um, uh, positions of um, non-heteronormative uh, experience that subjects can have that are seen as lacking the metaphysical unity that's represented by this function phallus. Um, Lacan's analysis of phallus is, is, however, is, is that there's fundamentally a um, incompleteness to this function, that it designates not a unity, but rather a gap or hole or um, absence. And so that uh, the function of patriarchy as an ideology is to always be covering up this absence by asserting that no um, male authority isn't based on a, isn't based on nothing, which in fact it is. It's a social function that isn't metaphysically grounded at all. It has nothing that holds it up in terms of the basic structure of reality. It's um, something that's imposed on as a social norm um, by human beings in history who are interested historical agents uh, to enact power over other groups that um, isn't supported by the nature of, of reality. It, it's arbitrary and contingent. But this is always being covered up by um, the ideology of patriarchy to say, no, um, in fact, the function phallus is the preeminent function of a kind of uh, metaphysical unity or self-totality 
that then through that total self-totalization then has a kind of innate natural authority to then have the function of command over that which is not itself, uh, that which is the other sex, woman, or queer, which is not heteronormative, or uh, all these other categories, that which is not white, straight, male, etc. So what Lacan is saying by sort of that um, when he says that there is no um, there is no big other, as he says, because the the function phallus as a patriarchal function is supposed to be upheld by this thing called the big other, this kind of super subject, which could be God, or it could be the king or monarch, or it could be just the father in the family who's seen as having this kind of um, uh, authoritative knowledge of uh, what other people are, and what they're supposed to be doing. And by saying that the there is no big other kind of Lacanian slogan, what Lacan is saying is that in fact, um, if you're the person fulfilling this function of the phallus of this male authority, um, you don't know what other people need or want or are doing. Um, in fact, there's this kind of um, uh, unfulfillable quality to what's supposed to be this phallic function. And so then for Lacan, the symbol phallus then signifies then this gap, this um, void that's actually what um, sustains uh, language normativity. Um, and so for Lacan, presence or the alleged allegation of presence is, in, is sustained through a kind of absence. And this links, um, this particular understanding is then linked in um, modern philosophy to um, a type of um, uh, Jewish speculative Kabbalistic idea of uh, if the Christian exoteric tradition sees God as a kind of presence mm. um, through a kind of unity that's totalized through a kind of social authority. In the Jewish tradition, especially the Jewish Kabbalistic tradition, the encounter with the divine is achieved through a kind of exile, through a kind of uh, the disappearance of God, whether that occurs through the destruction of the temple at the end of um, the Roman war, where Jews go into exile, or uh, this is understood as a more primordial absence of God where there never was an original God, but the character of God in Torah stands for a type of um, ethical command that then establishes a type of human community. Um, and so whether this is through figures like Martin Buber or Walter Benjamin or whoever, um, there's this kind of, um, or even Karl Marx, you have this kind of, um, uh, even Baruch Spinoza, you have this kind of Judaic critical element that's occurring in early modernity that um, is this subversive element within, um, within philosophy. And when Crowley identifies what he's doing with not the metaphysical unity, or rather that uh, there's this experience of mysticism of a kind of unity, but then there's a deeper understanding of how that unity is expressed through a kind of um, uh, nothingness, a kind of dynamic, creative, um, void place of the spirit mm -hmm. that... Um, so if the achievement of um, the metaphysical unity occurs in, so the, say, the Sifra, uh, Tifereth as you're going up the tree, uh, and that's expressed through the, the the Luke's formula, LVX formula, the, the, the Rosicrucian mysteries. So there's a kind of divine unity that's at least initially posited as a kind of um, spiritual unity that's outside of yourself that you're aspiring towards. And then that is kind of, um, you unify with that. And then that otherness of the divine kind of goes away and you realize that you're in fact united with that. But then that sense of unity also then slowly dissolves into a deeper understanding of um, a kind of um, uh, open spaciousness of being that's inherent to um, uh, what Buddhists call shunyata or the, the, um, mm -hmm. the idea that um, because there's no abiding self-essence to any phenomenon, if you in, 
let go of the this sense of um, being a, a, a self that's identical with itself, um, that the basis of a kind of deeper enlightenment is is then available to you and you can then identify with the kind of spontaneous creative the 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 voice from the silence that then utters forth the creative word directly from this place of the the void place of the spirit and that's expressed by what crowley calls the knox formula uh knox being not or nothingness and that's uh what he associates with the supernal triad above the abyss Mm -hmm in the tree of life as you're then moving up from Tifreth into these kind of deeper mysteries. But interestingly, he doesn't call it the Buddhist nothingness. He calls it the Kabbalistic nothingness, Mm -hmm. but that's an allusion to this, um, this Jewish Kabbalistic tradition of a kind of, um, if this sounds paradoxical from a Christian point of view, but from a Jewish point of view makes a lot of sense with this, which is a kind of, um, atheist understanding of, of God, um, where, God or the divine stands for a kind of um, human community that is realized through a kind of call to ethics that is achieved through the divine being experienced as a kind of presence that is understood through that presence being a kind of absence. Mm -hmm. Um, So Mm -hmm. um, Crowley is tapping into that um, kind of, um, you could call it atheist spirituality, but it's very much tied to a kind of um, modern Jewish spirituality that's especially expressed through the Kabbalah. So in Isaac Luria, you have this idea of simsum, the um, universe can only come into being through a kind of evacuation of the divine. But that evacuation is itself a kind of presency of the divine because there's the primordial yod that drops into the center of reality and then begins to permeate, permutate itself. Yeah. Um, and then you have the the writing of Torah from that. That's this these um, these flame letters, right? They're in black flame on the on the on the page, um, where all the little the the point the the pointed lettering represents this kind of divine flame that the Torah is written in. Um, and so for um, someone like. Um, Martin Buber, for example, um, he's interested in the, the, the practice of Torah by the, the Jewish community, um, not because he believes in God in a kind of Christian theistic um, metaphysical way, um, but because he understands the practice of Torah as material cultural practices that um, locate the divine within human, imminently within human community. And solidarity mm-hmm. and there's also a socialist element to this with zionism as a as a, as a kind of um, socialist element so there's also this marxist kind of you could even call it spirituality involved in that as well um and all of these are these kind of liberatory currents that operate at right angles or in a subversive way mm-hmm. to the more traditional christian colonial hegemonic understanding of what religion or spirituality is supposed to be about and so i read crowley's interpretation of the kabbalistic zero as the basis for his magic, uh, as taking that as kind of the ultimate standpoint from which you're uttering the creative word, this being the te- the formula of tetragrammaton, yod heh vav heh, that when you you utter this creative word through whatever formula that you're using, the mask being itself an expression of that, um, that he's linking himself to this um, type of subversive. Uh, post-Platonic type of spirituality that both incorporates but also radically critiques um, uh, that type of esotericism. So that's why, for example, I read Thelema as um, not just a continuation of theosophy or uh, but also a a kind of break with it, um, a kind of break or critique of Platonic metaphysics and the introduction, introduction of this element of what he calls the Kabbalistic zero, kind of divine nothingness which he says is um, a divine nothingness that is absolutely nothing, meaning that it also negates itself, meaning that if you're uh, conceiving of it as a kind of nothingness that's outside of reality, it's actually non-dual with reality. In other words, it's not to be thought of as in another world, but instead to be the quality of all manifestation in this Mm -hmm. world. 
and that's so that's why every point event in the space-time continuum directly expresses the Kabbalistic nothingness. And you could see this even in quantum mechanics, where um, any particular point event or quantizable, you know, um, phenomenon can be expressed in quantum mechanics by the letter psi, which expresses a kind of quantum field, which is a, a, a probabilistic. Um, um, the, the, the quantum field, when it um, uh, undergoes observation, when it undergoes interaction, um, isn't predetermined according to some metaphysical totality, what, how it's going to express itself. It has this innate freedom where it can be, it can, you know, the electron can appear in multiple different positions or orbits around the, when it's measured. And, um, and it's, it's, it's understood in the theory as being kind of this probability field that only when it comes into interaction becomes determined. And in a similar way, Hadith, the Hadith quality in uh, Philemic philosophy has a similar kind of um, uh, quantum expression in the sense that it can, when it um, magically expresses its experience, it can appear in multiple creative modes that aren't predetermined by the big other because there is no big other. This is expressed also in Einstein's um, special and general relativity, where particularly in special re relativity, why is it called relativity? It's called relativity because there is no universal um, perspective to determine. Um, um, so, for example, in Newton's um, physics, um, there's what's called the position subspecies eternus. Um, which first appears actually in Spinoza, but um, there's this idea that there's God's perspective and then time and space are this universal container where um, you can measure um, velocity and movement objectively from any point in relation to any other point in um, space, space and time, which are these objective containers. And so for Newton's uh, time, for example, flows in this objective order from the beginning of creation and it flows at the same rate for every observer in reality because it flows from the, the point of view of God's point of view, which establishes what time is. Einstein throws that out with relativity. There's no, um, the rate that time flows is relative to um, every different observer, every different Hadith point in reality. And the further out you go in space, the more different the flow of time is from an observer out there compared to where you are. And also in relationship to the speed of light, how fast or slow you're going in relation to that determines how time will flow at a different rate for different observers, um, depending on how much gravity there is, for example. Uh, if you're uh, deeper in a gravity field and there's more gravity, time will flow um, at, I think, a, is it a faster or slower rate than if there's less gravity? I can't remember, but anyway, depending slower, on how deep- Slower when there's more gravity. Exactly. Okay, yeah. so the deeper you are in a gravity field, time will flow slower in relationship to the perspective of somebody who's um, further out in space and there's less gravity. So the, the more gravity, the slow it slows time down. Um, and so the flow of time is, and, and is, is relative for that reason. So there is no point of view subspecies eternitus. Um, the uh, how you encounter space time depends on your own velocity relative to the speed of light or how much gravity there is depending on where your where your location is or how you move or whatever and so likewise in philema how your magical universe works depend on what parameters you set depending on your velocity or your relationship to gravity or whatever um that um uh, are determined by how you relate to your relationship to Nui, the, the space-time continuum. So, um, but this is relative. It's not set by the big other. You're you're the god that is maneuvering through space-time, through your orbit, as it were, to follow through the, the, the metaphor, to um, then determine um, how your magical universe is going to play out, whether you find yourself in heaven or hell, or you, you, you have ultimate agency, to determine that and so again there is no big other to determine that and so the function phallus back to the the phallic function 
Um, then actually for Lacan, uh, and also I think for Crowley, then names this openness to the Kabbalistic zero. So far from reinforcing the, the function of the Lord with a capital L or Thallus with a capital P, that signifier in the Gnostic Mass or other places that it appears in the Philemon Corpus, um, far from signifying this kind of the big other of the metaphysical unity that it imposes this patriarchal ordering from the perspective subspecies Eternitas, it's a reappropriation of that concept to instead directly express the Kabbalistic zero. So the function phallus in the Gnostic mass, instead of expressing the metaphysical unity is more deeply expressing this Knox function of the Kabbalistic nothingness. So it, exp it, is, it instead expresses the um, incompleteness of the function phallus so in other words, what that means, for example, in the Gnostic Mass is, is that the, um, the phallus is represented through its absence. So you don't actually use the, your physical genitalia that might be seen falsely as corresponding directly to, to phallus. Instead, you have a lance that symbolically stands in for the function phallus, but it does so through difference. It does, it does through, so through this kind of um, signifying or metaphorical function, which, which is already indicating that you're not, um, you're not directly essentializing this, this function. It's been detached, and now the, these gender signifiers be, become fluid. They begin to move around in the ritual, be able to be open to reinterpretation. And this, by the way, is why I also think that um, attempts to... Um, interpret the Gnostic mass in a more um, directly uh, biologically um, instantiated way. So for example, back in the 70s, there were some experiments with um, um, the, the priest being uh, a, um, uh, using their, their, their biological penis to be the, the, the lance in the mass, and then they would um, actually insert it into the insert themselves in the, 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 the usual way into the, um, into the priestess at the consummation of the, the mass. And I think it's correct that the community has kind of rejected that interpretation of the mass, but, but it's because it, um, for, for an interesting reason, which is that um, it's because it's, it's, it's too close to the, it's in a way misinterpreting the phallic function in the ritual by tying it too closely to the direct biological function, which it can be interpreted that way, but not necessarily. And so by pinning it down too much, you're, you're becoming too close to the, um, you lose a lot by making the phallus a penis. That's right. <laughs> if you approach the presence of the symbol through different, through absence, through, through a kind of symbolic displacement onto the lance, you're actually, somewhat paradoxically, but dialectically closer to the meaning of the, closer to the presencing of the, of the magical function involved than if you too closely identify it with the, um, the, the, some kind of biological essentializing interpretation. Um, this is the same reason that um, so much pornography is boring. Yeah. If you get to, it's the fantasy, it's the symbolic fantasy of intercourse that actually sustains the intimacy, that makes it interesting. If you get too close to the biological function, you lose the sexual element. And I think it's the same with the with the Gnostic mass. It's sexier if you um, approach the sex magic through a kind of symbolic distancing. It actually makes it more erotic than if you concretize it too much because then you've um, you've biologically essentialized it and it becomes, it lose, you realize that you, you don't have the presence of it anymore. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, and again, this is the, 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 the kind of dialectic of the, the phallic function, which is that it presents itself through patriarchal normativity as, um, having its essence through a kind of immediate self-totalizing presence to itself. But in fact, that's not actually how it works. The function phallus 
uh, functions to have its presence through a kind of absence, through a kind of failure of totality. It's able to um, then manifest its um, its symbolic function. Yeah. And that goes for sex magic as well. And I think Crowley actually understood that. And that's being expressed. That's why he has the Gnostic mass. He's showing you how to uh, ritualize sexuality to make it magical so that it's not just um, bare physical copulation, which is then boring and oppressive. But you, you, you make it sexier through introducing all of this kind of um, uh, presence through absence, through this kind of um, symbolic matrix. And that actually makes sex more interesting if you're doing that. Um, because you, you plug it into this kind of narrative, which then has this social component to it, where then you're exploring not just this immediate physical copulation, you know, but the physical pleasure that does come through that copulation, which you might also be doing, then has this whole sec has this whole social context to it, where you're expressing this this kind of social intimacy. That's then facilitated through what you might or might not doing be doing physically, which is also diverse, and has all these different potential interpretive modalities. Um, but then it's then related to by making it not reductive by making it integral, by making it more related to this, bringing in this larger context of signification and then working it out through that, you're bringing in this whole sociality to it that really makes it more interesting. But then that's the whole point. It's celebrating the communion of, of the divinity of the community in relationship to itself. Um, but that's immunitized also through also a kind of um, gap or uh, this this kind of dialectical nothingness that's also part of the part of the process yeah. um, where you can also have this symbolization of unity, but it's then expressed in this in this larger context of what Crowley calls the Kabbalistic zero, which I'm also linking to uh, this kind of Lacanian deconstruction of um, uh, patriarchal the patriarchal concept of unity, and that relates to this 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 whole um, French feminist kind of philosophy that's really rich and too too big to kind of bring more fully into the conversation. But it's also a conversation partner, and also this um, this Jewish Kabbalistic element that I think is very important to uh, what Crowley is doing as an an alternative subaltern um, kind of esotericism that is has this kind of imminent difference with Christianity at the same time. It's going on in the same place, but it's also it has this gap or difference that's also imminent. It's there. That's that's part of the conversation. That's important to bring into it mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, you know, we uh, the, uh, we are starting to a uh, slip of time, but uh, there's still some some issues I want to go through with. Yeah, you. let's go through and, that while we have yeah. time. Yeah, and I, I did I did have a question about about Hegel and dialectics. As I said at the beginning of the show, I, I I'm a big dummy, and I notice that if I say dialectical a lot, people think I'm smart. But you kind of did answer that question, right? In in what you're sure. just talking about, the zero uh, equals two, and and I think people can understand how this mask can be materialist, how you can be an atheist, how perhaps you should be an atheist. You know, that that I think there's a Zizek line, only only a religious person could be an atheist, only a Christian could be an atheist. Um, but, but just to clarify, and if you can kind of quickly uh, 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 sort of uh, clarify this for us, because I think some people are still going to be confused because they're going to hear about these. We've been talking about these these Egyptian deities. We've been talking about self-divinization. We've been talking about the power of the mass. So how, yes. how can this be an atheistic materialist uh, thing? And you just kind sure. of answered it, but if you can just make it a little bit more explicit. Sure. Let me um, pull this out. from um, my thesis here. I think, okay, let's see. Well, anyway, let me do it off the cuff because I think that's the better way anyway. Um, so the particular, um, reference to Zizek, for example, is that um, he has a whole 
I suppose you could call it an atheist theology. Um, and the idea of this is, is um, he has this clever way of going about it, though. He, he refers to G.K. Chesterton's call for a radical orthodoxy. And um, Chesterton talks about the, the excitement of, 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 of orthodoxy. And um, uh, Zizek says, well, I, I agree that you should have a kind of, um, there's a kind of excitement to orthodoxy. But the orthodoxy that he's interested in is um, the, the orthodoxy of the, the, the radical socialist atheist tradition uh, in modernity. Uh, particularly derived from from Karl Marx, but also involving a broader conversation with a lot of other anarchists or other. Um, and this fundamentally goes back to the theology of Ludwig Feuerbach. And for Feuerbach, um, the divine, the he's asking the question, what what is this concept of the divine or God or um, why do human beings in all civilizations have these religious or spiritual concepts and Feuerbach's conclusion is is that um although the platonic tradition had interpreted the divine as being ultimately and preeminently otherworldly that for Feuerbach and the particular Hegelian dialectical tradition that he's he's part of um the divine is that which is most preeminently human. Um, so for Hegel, spirit, he uses this German word Geist, but it's just the word spirit that you would use in religion or whatever. Um, this is preeminently um, human sociality. That when, in fact, you, you would even be able to go so far as to say that for, for Hegel, spirit is human society that it's human collectivity. It's what he calls the we that is I and the I that is we. It's the way that uh, our identity as human beings um, is embedded in these in this larger matrix of social projects and identities and vice versa, that those social projects or identities are posited historically by human beings to fulfill their own purposes. So there's a kind of loop to it. It's a dialectical circuit where both poles, the individual and society, are being posited simultaneously by each other through a kind of, if you want to use the Hegelian language, a double reflection of essence. And um, what that means is that, first of all, essence for Hegel is delocalized or decenters. It's a, it's a kind of fluid medium that floats, becomes fluid and floats between all these different categories of being. Um, and so it is itself this kind of fluid medium of again what he calls spirit um and so then uh for marx and feuerbach and this group called the the young hegelians they're taking this really radical insight that they see um because of course um hegel in a way is a he he's a gnostic he has this yeah. he's interpreting Thank the you. whole of the philosophical tradition in term that's come down to him and he's radically reinterpreting it in terms of this basic Gnostic insight. And the Gnostic insight is that he's an atheist and that God is humanity. God is the human spirit. And the human spirit is God. And so the divine that the Platonic tradition had posited as a beyond, an otherworldly beyond, that beyond disappears and is reabsorbed or reappropriated by human beings in their own social practices and their self-recognition of themselves as that locus of the divine. And uh, because Hegel's teaching in a context of the um, Prussian state, which is officially Lutheran or whatever, um, he has to kind of hide this in his philosophy. So he's always saying it and not saying it at the same time. It's this kind of esoteric, it's, it's what um, Marx calls the esoteric kernel within the exoteric sh uh, shell of Hegel's philosophy is to get to this radical um, kind of um, social concept of the human divine. And then that's what I think is so important about that is when you realize that, you realize that that's the radical basis of the um, 
so-called materialist tradition of, 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 the, of the left socialist tradition, uh, again, through all these kind of diverse um, expressions. Um, Marx is kind of this central consolidating uh, philosophical figure in a similar way that for modern magical traditions, Crowley is kind of serves a similar function for, uh, for magical theory or whatever. Again, there, it's not because there aren't more other people involved in the conversation, but the, you come to these kind of choke points where there's this particular kind of important philosophical figure who sort of sets the parameters for the conversation that then you then move forward on the basis of. And so um, there's a kind of um, radicalization, kind of carrying forward of the um, radical core of the this this insight that that um, that Hegel kind of cracks the code of all the previous, and so he's he's the first philosopher to proclaim the end of philosophy, which then becomes a kind of motif for a lot of later modern philosophers, whether that's Heidegger or Derrida or whatever. They're always proclaiming the end of philosophy. Well, what do they mean by that? Well, it really comes from Hegel because he's the one who first does this. They're all kind of footnotes on Hegel, just like philosophy is all footnotes on Plato. All of modern philosophy is kind of, after Hegel are kind of footnotes on Hegel. So, but what does that mean? Well, what it really means is it's a, it, it stands for this kind of reinterpretation of the Platonic legacy of philosophy, which is to say, okay, well, there's a divine unity, but it's beyond space and time. And what Hegel is going on is saying, no, it's radically incarnated within space and time. Um, and the, the, the Christian incarnation is hinting at this. And if you can radically understand what's going on from a Gnostic point of view of the, um, not a fideistic, exoteric point of view, but if you really understand what Gnostically the, the, the incarnation is about, it's Christ stands for humanity itself. And so when Christ dies on the cross, it's the death of God as a metaphysical beyond and then the human community becomes the is is then the divine, and so the the death of Christ on the cross stands for this transition from the divine being seen as otherworldly to the divine being seen in this imminent sense, and that links up to this kind of Jewish Kabbalistic element as well, that is kind of doing the same thing but in a Jewish mystical context rather than a Christian. They're kind of coming to this realization kind of ahead of the head of the game a little bit, and then you get to romanticism, and then all of these threads kind of discover each other, as it were. And then Hegel's the one who's read everybody that he's like, okay, now I see the interpretation. This is the guiding thread. This is the this is the thing that makes sense of everything. And um, he then calls that spirit in the phenomenology of spirit, where he arrives at the this kind of what he calls absolute knowing, which is really just the gnosis. Uh, at, in the final chapter of the phenomenology where he's realized, okay, everything leads up to this realization, which I can then back interpret everything that's retroactively that's led up to this to see how, you know, and it all comes together. It all comes together in this, in this, in this moment of realization. Now, of course, what that means is, is then very complicated because then it turns out that that has been realized in thought, but not in history. Meaning you, you, you could describe what I've just described and that's great and wonderful as a thought, you know, realization, but then how's that realized in the imminent human community? Well, it would have to be realized through some kind of human community that is universally egalitarian in terms of distribution of goods or so forth and rights. And um, this is implied by Hegel through um, um, the bourgeois liberal notion of mutual social recognition and a kind of notion of equal rights. But then what Hegel fails to realize that Marx does is, is that that's all useless unless this is economically realized in some meaningful way. In other words, again, you could have this idea of equal rights, but if there's an, uh, um, an equi economic disequilibrium of, in terms of the distribution of goods, then that'll create classes that then reinforces class hierarchies that then you're not equal in practice. You're equal in thought or on paper in the constitution, but then the way that society is actually structured is then a class society and then you're not um, equal. And so then that has to be politically 
overcome through some kind of larger project that he identifies with socialism or, or, or you know and there's there's various emancipatory social traditions that are then linked to that whether that's called anarchism or socialism or communism or what whatever you want to however you want to plug into that or, or the left or what again it's a it's a very complex broad conversation involving many hundreds of millions of people <laughs> at this point and whole societies that you know are trying to figure out what that might mean or not and then there's this reaction to that which is like no we don't want to have an egalitarian society we want to return to the earlier organic hierarchical model of society that was represented in tradition with a capital t in these medieval societies that had the truth and now there's this darkening of modernity that's gotten away from up from that um and the expression of that is fascism or other types of the right or however you want to articulate these more uh, conservative traditionalist types of attempts to return to a kind of, and so then you've got the basic opposition between organic hierarchical metaphysical platonic heteronormative patriarchal etc that package and in opposition historical complex opposition to that you've got you know when crowley says okay i'm in the left wing of the city of the pyramids what does he mean by that well that means that he's identifying him in his philosophy with the emancipatory egalitarian universalist um you know socialist in the sense of there being a kind of level playing field where people can then you know you can it's all great to say that you can develop your unique expression of being but there needs to be some kind of level playing field where you can then have the resources to do that um and then um you've got to break down all these traditional hierarchies so you're going to be you know queer and feminist and um you know be open to all these different expressions of uh of, of gender or sexuality um and so um and so crowley's shorthand for all of that is this thing that he calls the kabbalistic zero and he says it's equal to the two what's the two the two is phenomenal reality the world of duality and appearance um and so he's saying that um in place of the subordination of the world of duality to the metaphysical unity through this organic hierarchy of being instead he's going to directly identify the dynamic creativity of the kabbalistic zero with the world of diverse phenomenal appearance and so you then take your stand in the kabbalistic zero then you can directly express the creative world from wherever your unique experience or location is because of relativity because uh, every inertial inertial frame of reference is correct and to interpret it it's there there is no subspecies eternal there is no big other that determines the rate of the flow of time or um how velocity is expressed in relation to other things based on some kind of god's point of view every unique inertial frame of reference within the cosmos um you know Einstein says every point of view is correct from its own point of view. You just have to find the equations to figure out how that's then going to relate to everybody else's point of view. And you can do that if you realize that time is relative, that the flow of time is not the same based on this other constant called the speed of light. And then you've got to, and then you don't need, you don't need Newton's um, universal abstract god's point of view container that everything's supposed to be contained in and have its place and its role no everything is expressing its own unique velocity and you know flow of, everybody's flow rate of the flow of time is right from their point of view that's what time is period there there, there is no universal flow of time there's a flow of time that's expressed based on what your velocity is compared to everything else that's going to be um, your flow of time and from whatever that point of view is time just appears to flow normally for you because it is flowing normally for you and it's different than and the, everybody else's inertial frame of reference and the further out you go in the universe the more different from you it's going to be but their flow of time out there is also correct 
because it's just the way time is flowing from their point of view, which is correct because there is no absolutely correct way that time is supposed to flow because that's the thing that drops out of the picture. So um, relativity is um, the consequence in physics of there being no God, um, which Newton, because he was a theist, couldn't get to because he had this metaphysical assumption that was preventing him from being able to um, sort of play out the implication. And so what Einstein does as this atheist Jew who comes along later, who doesn't have to be this Christian theist because he's Jewish and so he's not part of that conversation. He comes along later and he sits down and he says, well, what if um, there is no difference between, um, you know, being in an elevator going up and you feel the pressure coming down or you're just on the earth and you feel the gravity pushing you and there's this acceleration. But what if there's actually no real difference between these two? And he starts playing out these thought experiences and he realizes I can generalize this relativity principle to all of physics and I can solve every problem in Newton's, in Newton's physics by doing this because I've realized what was wrong in his physics. And what Aleister Crowley is doing with the revelation of the Book of the Law and his philosophical essays, Bereshith and Essay on Ontology, when he's coming up to writing this poetic, mythological um, prose poem that kind of expresses and encapsulates this realization that he's had, he's realized that in a similar way through this concept of the Kabbalistic zero, which is a kind, it's an expression of Einstein's relativity principle because he's also part of this larger modern conversation. He's arriving in his own sort of, um, in his own department, which is spirituality, as opposed to Einstein, which is physics. He's, a, he's arriving at this realization. And by the way, Special Relativity is published in 1904. It's the same year as the, the reception of the Book of the Law. So it's Einstein, along with a bunch of other people, they're, they're all arriving at this kind of same, it's this mo moment in modernity where everybody's kind of arriving from different places socially in this similar realization. It's almost like a, a new time is beginning, like a new, new period of or time. Era or no, right, <laughs> a new era. New eon or era or something is happening. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe it was Virginia Woolf who said sometime around like the early 1900s, human nature changed, she said. Yeah. Okay. What is, how is that expressed? Well, Crowley realized, okay, if I throw out this need for there to be this ultimate metaphysical unity beyond time and space, and instead every point of view is then the unique expression of the divine, the formula changes, and I'm going to write it out, zero equals two, and then just like with Einstein, he could solve everything that was wrong with Newton's physics, Crowley realized, oh, I can solve everything that was wrong with Christian colonial metaphysics. I've I've got it now. I've got the key. I've got the key. The 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 key to the mysteries, as it's called in in the book of the law, which is this nothingness. And he says the Jews have it. It's this formula of I enter nothingness. All you've got to do then is just theurgically interpret it to then link up with all the other stuff. And so you have this collision, like in um, T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which is all this. It's mostly quotations from other stuff that he's then integrated in this new modern worldview to make sense of the, the, the collapse in the First World War of the, the Christ, again, this organic hierarchical Christian colonial worldview that had collapsed. And uh, Crowley and Einstein are just a little bit ahead. They're anticipating rather than having it happen and then have to figure out what happened. They, they're able to see it a little bit ahead of time that this is what is happening and then kind of get ahead of the game a little bit. Um, and so Crowley is then applying this relativity principle, except it's to spirituality, it's to religion. And then he's like, okay, well then God is dead. And then what's left, well, then it's the human spirit is then the divine. And what is it that we were all, we've always been able to do that's more primordial than dualistic religion? Well, it's magic. Human beings have always been able to practice magic. And guess what? In modernity, it's what we're still able to do. God is dead, but then human beings are then divine, and we have imminently the divine power, which is to perform magic, meaning that we can construct our own social reality and mutate it how we, how we will within the given material conditions that we have to then relate to. What's then the definition of magic? The science and art of causing change and conformity with will. 
which is exactly then conformable with that that ideal. And of course, you you have, as Marx says, material conditions that you have to work with, but they're mutable. And what is it that is distinctive about human beings? It's what Marx calls production. We make our own world. And through making the world, we make ourselves and remake ourselves. And through then a kind of technognosticism, we can remake the world through technology, which is then also in modernity, then radically advancing. Then that becomes the, this magical means through computers and the internet. These are magical. The Science is magic and magic is science, as it was understood in earlier modernity. And then we lose sight of that. And then we come back into realizing that that was the case again. And then, um, but we have this wonderful thing. We have this alchemy that works now called quantum mechanics, where it's just like the medieval alchemy, except it works now. <laughs> we can transmute elements. We can we can control form at the level of atomic structure from the most basic level of, of uh, the way that particles interact. And we can now do all this stuff, including computers, where we can have artificial minds that can then allow us to calculate whatever we want. And then we have the counterpoint to that at the macro scale, which is, of course, general relativity that allows us to explain and control the um, time-space continuum on a macro level that we can now travel within and do work our will within and explore. And so then it's a, just like um, natural magic, except now it works. Okay, we understand the occult properties of things because we've now completed the theory that was beginning with the kind of natural magic that, and alchemy that was going on in early modernity. But it's not that we transcended that, we've completed it. It's not that we got away with that and then we have this other thing called science. They're the same thing. It's the same project. It's exactly, the, it, it's just we're, we're now a few centuries further on and so we've got further on with the same project. And so in early modernity, we have like the Rosicrucian manifestos and John Dee and Agrippa and so forth and they're saying, there's this alternative to trying to just revive traditional Christianity and make it work in modernity, which is what the Reformation was about. What if we go to this other thing called the Hermetic Sciences? And we're the locus in this thing called Gnosticism, where we're, we're, the divine, we're the locus of the divine, and we have this thing called science that allows us to magically manipulate reality to do whatever we want. And then um, we can then actualize our divine potential. And this is what's prophesied in the, the, the general reformation that's being prophesied in the Rosicrucian manifestos. What Gordano Bruno was talking about with, you know, forget Christianity, let's go back to um, occult magic as the basis for religion. What? Okay, well, here we are a few centuries later, what are we doing? Um, you know, it, it's these earlier figures who kind of have it figured out, and then it gets more and more explicit, the further you move into modernity. And then Hegel, you know, is and Marx and Crowley and Einstein and, you know, um, all these other figures, they're, they're, they're cracking the code. They're just working out and make more and more explicit what's already implicit all the way back at the beginning of modernity with Baruch Spinoza and the Rosicrucian manifestos and the, the, the magical revival that's occurring in parallel with the Reformation that they're also afraid of because they medieval Christianity is broken down and now people are exploring all these alternative spiritualities of which the Reformation is attempting to both facilitate but also clamp down on. Yeah. It's like, oh, I went to, we went too far. Oh no, what, what do we need to do? Okay, well, how's about uh, Calvinism as this authoritarian um, philosophy that is like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna stop all this messing around and have this authoritarian paradigm. Or it's, I think. Um, I think John Calvin is the first modern totalitarian because it's yeah. the first person to realize, okay, we've irrevocably broken into this new space, but now we, he's like the first, he's like the first modern conservative, the first reactionary, the first fascist. He's like, okay, but now we have to control it. Now we've got to, we've got we, people have broken out of the slavery of slavishness of medieval religion. Now we've got to somehow re-enslave everybody to get this under control because it's, I can't deal with it. The, the, you know, the, the, um, everybody's making up their mo their own mind about what the truth is supposed to be. And no, I need to control that. My truth that I've interpreted the, the, the gospels or whatever, that's the only truth. And I need to, like, uh, everybody's got to obey that. And, um, 
And so that's the, and again, you have this kind of emancipatory and also this reactionary tendency that define the whole terrain of modern thought and, and ideology as these two, as these, as these, um, you know, human beings have to have to figure out, are we going to end modernity by re-enslaving ourselves or are we going to all liberate ourselves? Which is, which is it going to be, which is it going to be? And everybody takes, takes sides and you can, you can plot it out on a graph as you, you know, all the way down through modernity, who's doing what to achieve what, and you can identify pretty clearly who the emancipatory figures are and who the ones who are against that. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a fascinating way to read history. And you could say that's from a Gnostic or a, you know, a, a new eon or per perspective, but there is a, a, a an interpretation within modern philosophy that modernity itself is a kind of Gnosticism. Uh, and um, Juan Culliano, Mercedes Aliada's student, has this interpretation, but he's not the only one. There's a whole swath of both. Um, We're looking at you, Cyril O'Regan. Right, right. Come on, right. come on the show, Dr. O'Regan. And this is a ma major element in theology as well. And it's just, and and there's, there's both um, conservative, figures who decry this and there's also marxist or other types of you know uh, figures who think this is wonderful and this is exactly what should be happening and um and so it's just where you where you want to be in the where you want to be in the crypt but that it is happening i think is not um i think is pretty clear Precisely. and um and is is a solid place to sort of uh ground historiography you know a, a constructive historiography of what modernity is uh, it's a kind of techno technological Gnosticism um, and it destroyed the organic hierarchical medieval, you know, agrarian economically based. Um, and that means that modernity is also tied to this other thing called capitalism, which is extremely ambiguous that both frees and also enslaves human beings literally in the sense of like the Atlantic slave trade is an early example of capitalist expansion. So I don't use the word slavery just metaphorically. It's also, it, it's quite literal as well. So, um, so we have to engage with that complexity as well. And then again, it's, it's, you know, it comes down to what side you're on. Yeah. Are you for the emancipation, emancipation of humanity or are you, you know, going to seek its further enslavement because you gain some class benefit from that? based on where you're located in the still persisting social hierarchies that are all the more magnified um, by modernity as well. So it's just, and this is all ongoing. This is, this is gonna, in a way, modernity is also kind of apocalypse. And Crowley it's is becoming able to- more and more evident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Crowley also articulates that in the book of the law where the new eon is a kind of, apocalypse which is a transition yeah. to a further actually emancipated eon that ha we, we haven't gotten there yet it's all this is all a kind of proleptic anticipation which is modernity itself of there's been this really radical release of human potential but then where's that going to fall down is there going to be some world dictator that emerges or do human beings create some human community that we can actually survive in and, and, and prosper in and um uh, and there's all kinds of setbacks and cul-de-sacs that emerge in that, and it's it's a it's a it's a very rich place to situate a kind of modern theology, a kind of modern Gnostic theology within. It, it sure think. is, yeah. And that's that that's why we need you to uh, publish about a hundred papers on the topics you were just talking about, <laughs> so that Nick and I have sources when we're doing our academic work. Thank you. I am trying to again, complete my uh, thesis as a book. I've, I've set as a goal to oh, awesome. complete a more final draft of that in the coming year. And I've got some friends of mine in Sacramento that are going to help me with the, the publication of that um, with some of the, you know, as we're coming out of the quarantine and more social activity becomes active, the, the community is kind of regenerating itself. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that. And um, I've been... Um, haven't gotten as much work as I need to get done in the, during the quarantine period towards turning my yeah, thesis yeah. into a book. And so it's still something that's still circulating in manuscript. Thank you both for taking a look at it and giving me some feedback also in these, these interviews. Uh, and that's very helpful in the process of eventually getting this thing published. I hope within the next year or two, uh, I can get it out so that yeah. it's in a, um, and of course you can always cite the, 
fact that because the doctoral version has itself been been kind of published exactly um, so we, we do have to start wrapping up uh, before yeah, we do yeah uh before we do if uh if, if this if this has inspired you to read uh hegel and lacan then you can send your complaints into <laughs> jason at gnosticwisdom.net um and talking about complaints that you can send into jason at gnosticwisdom.net I, I do want to wrap up with one question if, if you can try to give it to us in five minutes uh dr sure. Biorgi. um it's uh i'll never say your name right either but i'm trying uh it's all good Okay, okay. So again, uh, the, the, the complaints, Jason at GnosticWisdom.net. But uh, the, the, talking about perhaps some, some spiritual politics, some occult politics, can't, I was under the impression, I wasn't, this is a leading question, but let's pretend. Yes. I was under the impression, can't the Gnostic Mass only be celebrated by a specific organization, members of a specific, a specific organization, this OTO that, that you've mentioned Great. a number of times? I can give you an easy five-minute answer to that, less Great. than five minutes, which is absolutely and certainly no. And uh, Crowley himself clearly intended the Gnostic Mass to be published in a number of different contexts. And we know this because towards the end of his life in the 1940s, um, he was sponsoring a person by the name of, uh, I think, uh, is it John Crow? I'm not sure, yeah. but the, the, who started this group that was called the Gnostic Church or something like that, which was an OTO independent and unaffiliated group that um, uh, Crowley was in correspondence with this person, sending them letters and saying, hey, use the Gnostic Mass for your Gnostic Church. Here it is. Anybody can use it. Go, go take this and use it. Uh, and the implication there, which is quite explicit that Crowley is making, is, is that uh, although this was originally written for this group called the OTO, um, it's also written for anybody in any context to to use. Uh, and I've known even uh, people who aren't explicitly Thelemites who, who use and celebrate it as well in certain contexts. And um, at this point, it's pretty much spread kind of throughout the world and um, all kinds of different people do it. And... Um, it will always have a historical connection to this particular initiatory order, the OTO. Um, but that doesn't, um, that doesn't mean that it has to be um, specifically um, practiced in that context. And Crowley himself was, I think, reasonably explicit about this uh, in his own correspondence. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Crow correspondence is available online. You can Google it. it, it you can pop it up. You can make up your own mind on that. That's the short, quick, and I think uh, decisive answer to that question. Oh, hey. I, um, believe he, I believe he sent it to Stalin as well, or tried, he didn't, he not directly, but he tried to get it to the Soviet The letter was written yeah. to Trotsky. He's oh, okay. a little bit more of an interesting yeah. person than yeah. Stalin in my mind. Um, yeah. And uh, the idea was is that he thought that um, uh, because they were dismantling the Eastern Orthodox Church in the Soviet Union, Crowley was in favor of that. And he wrote a letter set to uh, Trotsky saying, hey, you're abolishing Christianity in the Soviet Union. Why don't you adopt me as your central spiritual <laughs> teacher instead? Maybe that would have that'll help out. facilitate that, that process. Uh, he was writing a whole bunch of letters to different uh, prominent uh, figures, um, sort of making these kinds of proposals. Um, but it is indicated that um, he did not um, consider... Uh, Philema or his philosophy to be incompatible with um, uh, explicit communism, which I think is important to uh, to keep in mind, again, to push back against this um, oddly resurgent kind of libertarian conservative element that we keep running into these trolls on the internet who want to push this idea that um, uh, Crowley's philosophy is somehow compatible with their misogynistic, um, classist kind of um, uh, views and it's just not historically true. It's just not not representative of who the early Thelemites were or what they were about. Um, and um, there's a, there's just a whole lot of, of uh, really interesting overlap uh, with a lot of different uh, emancipatory kinds of philosophies, and some of that includes communism. It just does. Well, uh, the wrap up is now. If, uh, do you have an online presence uh, that, that, where, where people can, can discover your work or anything? Or? I've definitely got my ongoing uh, YouTube channel, Liberation yes. Theurgy, with Dr. Nathan Diorgi, and I continue to have regular updates. Um, not always on a weekly, but sometimes on five weeks. I'm, I'm trying to have, um, I, I continue to have regular updates on that 
channel, so please check it out. And I'm hoping to have some more stuff on the Kahneman theory as well. I've just done a video on the Star Ruby where I talk about uh, the interpretation of the signifier phallus in that that relates to that ritual that uh, relates precisely to what we were just talking about in this interview. And I'll have a whole bunch of more stuff that's going on. And I've got over 20 videos there, several hours worth of material. And uh, I'm also doing a uh, online course coming up on esoteric antecedents of Kalima. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you'd like the, the link to uh, signing up for that course, which is um, like a 12 hour course for just $80, um, uh, you can uh, email me at uh, alam93 at AOL.com, B A L A M 93 at AOL.com, and I can send you the link for that. Uh, for that class and um, uh, you can also I'm on Facebook under my name and I, you can also communicate with me uh, via that and I can give you the link to that as well um, that's starting up December 10th and um, happy to have people join me for that class we're going to look at a whole bunch of interesting early modern figures Jacob Burma Emanuel Swedenborg the Hermetic Order of the Golden, Golden Dawn the Esophical Society Rosicrucian Manifestos all kinds of fun stuff We'll definitely link all that up in the show notes. So if you uh, so so click all those links, check all that out. Nick, uh, quickly, where do you want people to find you? Um, you can uh, fill my blog, so the light and if you want to contact me through that. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, um, where I just want to say to thank <laughs> to, th to thank you that I have frequently argued with people over this kind of Neoplatonic traditionalist interpretation of Kalima. So I love hearing all of that stuff and, and reading it in your work. So. Uh, but yeah, you can follow sure, me there sure. as well at NJ Lichetti on uh, Twitter. Yeah. Sure. And uh, you can also help us uh, support the show, patreon.com slash Gnostic, paypal.me slash Gnostic, or just tell people about the show, take this episode, send it to a pal. Okay, everybody, thanks so much. Thanks so much again, Dr. Biorgi, and uh, we will be in touch. Bye. Okay, great. <laughs>